welcome to Theo Trade. This is Don Kaufman. October 14th, 2022. There's just about 23 minutes left inside of this trading week. And what a trading week it has been. The big question though, of course, will all of this volatility end with a bang? We're going to do once again, a very in-depth, very quantitative look at markets this week as volatility not only has it not abated it's uh it's getting more extreme out there and i want to explain precisely what that entails one of the first looks i want to give you it's not so much about hey where are the s and p's right now it's about this they're reversing what was a uh well 100 point rally yesterday don't worry they're giving it all back right now but before we even get there Let's take a, a glance at the SPX, the mother of all products, just to give you a feel in terms of, uh, I kind of call this like orientation of will, if you will, of where we've been on the week. <clears throat> you know, this week actually started off maybe with a little bit of a whimper compared to, of course, Thursday. Thursday, we hit CPI numbers. CPI comes in hot. Marketplace absolutely tanks, breaks through the lower edge of the expected move, then explodes some almost 200 handles higher only to cough it almost all back in today's trading session the interesting and ironic reason that i am bringing all of this up is take a look where the week uh started so the spx started the week right at uh 3640 we're trading basically let's call it 3600 right now so we had to go just everywhere to get absolutely nowhere, 40 handles. I mean, that's as close to massively unchanged as you're ever gonna get with that kind of price action in a market. But hey, listen, after all of that, you're like, great, so where are we going? Again, that's exactly what we're gonna focus on in this weekend's update here. So the S&Ps, take a look at them right now. The S&Ps, they're down just about 76 handles. One of the things, that becomes a little bit alarming as you start looking at markets and you're like, yeah, cool, man, we're down uh, 76 handles. Like the volatility is so extreme. Like why, you know, my first bullet here on this update is Spoo's taking 150 to 200 point moves in stride. That's not a good sign. If you're looking at the S and P's, you're like, oh, again, <laughs> like 2% moves are becoming, you know, the norm on a day-to-day -day basis. But when you start looking at it from absolute high, to low, but people, it's considerably more than that. Again, it's becoming extremely concerning at how significant some of the ranges happen to actually be. And the significance behind that, well, is uh, again, exactly what I'm about to elaborate on because this lends itself very nicely to be able to answer that question, is, uh, is all of this volatility going to end with a, uh, a significant bang. All right, let's get right down to it. The second bullet on this weekend's update. People, we are in a considerable volatility box. I've seen some volatility boxes in my day, but I'm not sure if I have anything to compare, all right, to what we're presently in. Well, again, allow me to explain. When I start using the terminology volatility box, I don't want to throw anybody off by that one. I just simply want to state, okay, before I actually detail why this is so important, I want to state, okay, the volatility box just simply means this these levels where we're just channeling literally back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. We're stuck, okay, inside of a very definitive box okay you can call it support resistance you call it whatever you want all right as a you know again i grew up in this business and i've been in the you know the market making side of the business the brokerage side of the business is obviously i've been a retail trader throughout uh throughout a significant amount and again i've seen a lot of volatility boxes but this one's right up there and the reason it's right up there is if you take a look okay at the uh at the range for the most part well what we're looking at here is a range the bottom of it is right around 3,600. The top of it, okay, is right around 3,800. We broke out the bottom of it uh, yesterday, which is Thursday for a brief and fleeting moment. Again, this is a 30-day, one-hour chart. Okay, all we've done for the last literally three weeks of trade is channel back and forth, okay? 
inside of this vol box. You go, okay, so who cares? Okay, the longer we're in the box, the more violent the break is going to be. And that's exactly what I am going to display to you kind of quantitatively here. So before I get into the like kind of full blown kind of quant mode for a second, um, I'm gonna cruise over and I'm gonna show you there's a high correlation and there's an incredible concentration of liquidity associated with this particular volatility box. Now, again, when I start talking about, you know, 3,600, 3,800, for those of you that are technical analysis geeks, you're like, yeah, man, he's speaking my language. I'm not actually showing you the levels in the S&Ps because I care about the chart. I'm showing you the levels in the S&Ps because you have this 200 point range, okay, and we're pinging back and forth. Just the fact that we're at the bottom of it right now, you're like, we're going to break out of the bottom. Maybe not. Okay. And I'm going to show you exactly why this is so important. So high correlation, before I actually get back to the vol box here, high correlation, what I mean by high correlation, every single day that we've traded recently, it's all of a sudden like, okay, everybody to one side of the boat. What side of the boat are we on right now? Well, this is the side of the boat where we go down. <laughs> uh, everything for the most part is correlated. All right, so it, when you start looking at an advanced decline line, I personally, I like the S&P, the S&P 100. Why do I like it? Who cares about the other 400 stocks? I mean, anything that can rock the boat is in the S&P 100. So we're literally on one side of the boat or the other. We had an up day yesterday, up day. We ripped by about 93 handles inside of the S&Ps. Yeah, guess what? Every single product for the most part is up. Today, we actually opened with an extremely strong okay, advanced decline line, only to actually see the advanced decline line, it just cratered. Again, if you uh, if you looked earlier today, the advanced decline line was uh, was rocketing <clears throat> until the whole thing completely flipped over. Okay, Everybody started racing to the other side of the boat. So high correlation. <clears throat> Why does high correlation matter? Because what's in charge is not individual stocks. One of the things that you're going to see that's kind of almost like missing from this weekend's update, I'm not going to talk a tremendous amount. Like, what do you think about Apple? I've told you over the last couple of things, all over the last couple of weeks, what I thought about Apple. It's going to get killed, right? And killed it has. So we're not even going to talk that much about individual equities. Right now, it's all about concentration of liquidity. It's all about okay high correlation. And I cannot stress that enough. <clears throat> when you have a high correlation, it basically means that the index products themselves, they're in charge. If all of a sudden there's huge sell side activity in the S&Ps, they, they just simply go down. All of a sudden there's some buy side in here, we rock it to the upside. Everything's about the dynamic right now okay, of the S&Ps. And the S&Ps are gonna lead everything. Yes, the NASDAQ matters. There's no question some of the individual stocks matter, but the driving force right now, everybody on the street is watching the S&Ps. Okay, you call any desk right now, they're all watching the S&P futures. And if you don't have S&P futures on your screen, look at the spiders. It's the same animal, you know, times 10, if you will. So high correlation is obviously critical because it's one of the primary and driving factors behind the marketplace, right? And in a high, very correlated stance, you can get much larger moves, much more dramatic moves, because again, everybody is moving to the same side of the boat at the exact same time. I think that uh, was explained to me, you know, early on. And I, I thought that was always the greatest analogy. I'm like, okay, everybody get on one side of the boat. You're like, you do that, it'll flip over. Okay. And you're like, exactly. And that's precisely what you're seeing right now. The next critical point to be made is there is a phenomenal concentration of liquidity. Okay, when I talk about concentration of liquidity, the best way to see the concentration of liquidity is not necessarily look at the S&P futures. The S&P futures are predominantly used as a hedge against SPX. So when I talk about concentration of liquidity, think about the options market. We're going to open up here on Thinkorswim today's option statistics. Just take a quick glance at the SPX. The SPX is doing about 2.7 million contracts. All right, just to give you guys a quick heads up, you know, on average this year, on average this year, the marketplace has been doing just over, okay, 40 million option contracts <coughs> per day. So 40 million a day is typically what the entire 
options market does. That's the equity and index options market does about 40 million. In a rocking day, we'll do like yesterday, we did like, uh, oh, almost 54 million contracts yesterday, which is, you know, put on your big boy pants. Today is not quite as rocking of a day. But by the end of the day, we might do as many, as many as 45 to 50 million. You know, again, I'm not going to sit here and add up everything in the entire S&Ps. Uh, the Options Clearing Corp does that for you. So I think by the end of today, we're probably being somewhere near, okay, 50 million contracts, 45, 50 million contracts. Imagine that the SPX alone does almost 3 million of those. And you're like, okay, dead silence. You're like, yeah, okay, that's not that much. But the SPX, is a, just a huge multiple larger than most of the other products. But now, bear with me. If you looked at the spiders, okay, let's cruise over to the spiders for a second. So we go to the spiders, open up their option statistics. They're good for what? Oh, about 9.5. Start adding this up. Come on. So you got, let's, well, let's just round this. This is 10 million. The SPX is going to do what? Okay, another 3 million. So just between the spiders, just between the spiders and the SPX, you already have 13 million contracts. Yeah. Okay, what else you got? You want to throw some Qs in there? Sure, because the Qs are heavily correlated, of course, with the S&Ps. Okay, those are good for another 3 million. So what are we up to right now? Huh? So you just took the Spiders, the SPX, the Qs. You're already up to about 16 million. Throw a little VIX in there. What is the VIX is probably good for about a mil. Okay, yeah, just shy of a million contracts here. Done. Do you realize, okay, I just added up a handful of products. I didn't even get to stuff like IWM. Okay, I really didn't. I didn't get to IWM, which I could throw it in there. I mean, for the most part, just a handful of products are doing north of about 17 million contracts of a marketplace that's only doing, let's say, between 45 okay, and 50 million. And you're like, okay, so where are you going with this? So you have this, let's say, 45 million contracts, of which we're doing about 17 million of them in basically four products. You talk about concentration of liquidity, it's freaking ridiculous. But here is the biggest takeaway from that. The SPX is about 20 times the size of most products. So for the most part, when it comes to dollar denomination, like what we call notional value, how much money is really moving in these markets, over half the capital, over half the capital that's moving Okay, and these 45 million contracts, over half of it belongs just to the SPX alone. It's absolutely sick amounts of money because the entire marketplace right now is just surrounding the S&Ps. And it has been, okay, and it has been for a long time, but now we're getting this, it's this incredible concentration of liquidity. You go, oh, okay, so who cares? Yeah, this is the point where you should really pay attention. Because we are in the vol box, okay? What's in the box? We're in the volatility box. What do you think is actually transpiring in here, right? <clears throat> and the answer to that is, well, okay, and I kept, yeah, I've, I've talked about this at nauseum, right, the last couple of weeks. All we're doing at this point, okay, is accumulating open interest. Open interest, okay? Open interest, the longer you are in the exact same range, the greater, okay, the open interest ultimately becomes. We are sitting on right now, and I hate to use this terminology, like the atomic bomb, if you will, of open interest, which translates to gamma risk. If you are a market making firm, what we term a dealer, okay, everything that you've done as a market maker has fit between roughly 3,600 3,800 for what? The last three weeks. What do you think is going to happen when we crack 3,800 or 3,600? I'm not here, okay, to say, oh, we're going to go up and we're going to go down because, listen, I've been through volatility enough, okay? I know better than that. <clears throat> when we crack this range, you want to talk about some violence in trade, it's going to make this little CPI you know, glitch, we dropped a hundred handles in no time, gonna make it look, okay, like child's play. We are sitting on, again, this mass, okay, of risk right now. <clears throat> and you go, well, why? Again, open interest continues, all right, to add up. The longer we stay in a particular range, and which open interest? The open interest in the SPX, the open interest in the spiders, the open interest in the QQQs, the open interest even in VIX. Look, VIX has been boxed in pretty good too. Like everywhere you look, 
we are inside of this box. <clears throat> and it just continues to kind of gather risk and gather risk. Okay, you look at the spiders. That's all pretty much in the same range, right? The SPX, the mother of all products. Again, what is the hedge for the SPX, the S&P futures? Okay, so you start looking and all of the options that are trading are pretty much right there. You know, people like to trade some out-the-money options, and all we're doing is just pushing risk forward at this point in time. Again, the volatility box, in my opinion, this is what matters right now. You know, it's what's going to crack the volatility box. It's going to be some, you know, catalyst, obviously. We kind of thought that CPI would do it. CPI did do it for a brief and fleeting moment. We jumped right back inside of it. Okay, everybody back in the boat. It's going to be crazy. All right. This is where I say, will this volatility end with a bang? Well, this volatility box that we're in unequivocally is going to end okay, with serious, serious violent moves in the marketplace. To try to handicap whether breaking to the upside or the downside, that's what we're going to do here in just a moment. Okay. In fact, to look at that, I'm going to kind of do things a little bit in reverse. Obviously, we have some earnings. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But to get a better feel, of like, okay, where is the market more likely to go? At this point, without unequivocation, sure, you can say it's leaning to the downside. Leaning to the downside, of course, because we're at the lower edge of the range. But to give you a little bit more confluence there, we want to look at stuff like bonds. Take a look at the bonds. The bonds are through what I term the thin red line. The bonds at 124, that was a critical red line for me okay and and again is it a real technical level probably not but bring, breaking under 124 it just for the nasdaq okay you might as well just stick a fork in us we're done if the bonds stay under this 124 level they're gonna break when the bonds break it's gonna snap the back of the nasdaq yet again and at this point if you're not looking at fed fund futures like, it's crazy. I mean, it's completely out of control. If you look at the Fed Fund Futures, this is the uh, CME FedWatch tool. We now have a 98% probability of a 75 basis point hike. They're even giving a 1.4% probability to a full 100 basis point hike. There's not even a consideration at this point that we're going to do 50 basis points, which, again, this does not look good. Looks like the Fed is going to uh, jam rates right up at 75 basis points yet again. Still a lot of time though, okay? A couple of weeks between now and the next FOMC meeting, a whole lot of other events could actually grip hold of this marketplace. One of which could be a massive break lower inside of the bonds. I've talked about that pretty much till I'm blue in the face. I believe that our bond market, our treasury market, is going to actually knock the Fed right back into a corner and force them to actually change their tune. That could happen. It's any day. Again, the thin like red line there, that 124 handle inside of the bonds, that did it for me. Breaking underneath that is just, it's horrendous at this point. Next point to be made over here. So <coughs> bonds are lower. Okay. Lends itself to the S&Ps exploding lower. We're at the 3600 level. Like you just can't feel warm and fuzzy. Okay. We're at the lower edge of our volatility box. The bonds are at the lower edge. They're breaking down. Then we come over to the dollar. Now I've mentioned this a lot recently where I kind of figured like dollar and the bonds would be taken out of the equation for a period of time, but they haven't been. The dollar, this thing looks like it's starting to short squeeze. Why do I say that? Look at some of the violence in the moves. Again, this is where I was talking about earlier. It's like, you know, you get used to like 100, 150 point moves inside of the S&P futures. You're like, oh yeah, whatever, man, whatever. Like that's not good. This looks like it's actually squeezing inside of the dollar. This is going to be a trade to watch. <clears throat> Why? Break above 114, we're almost certainly going to explode higher on the dollar, which would just implode the S&P futures at that point. And again, that's where volatility is going to end with a bang. You better believe it. Like volatility is going to end with a bang in here. I'm going to jump back around to the energy complex. One thing that I just, I can't help but be bothered by is where oil remains. Okay. Oil to me and the energy sector itself <coughs> is not pricing in 
Okay, this is just not the kind of price action you want to see. Okay, an effort to form a bottom in the S and P's, right? In the S and P's, I know that there's a lot of geopolitical risk. We could go on all day just about the energy sector. But the bottom line is the energy complex itself, like XLE. Take a look at it. Year to date is still up 40 percent. Now you're like, okay, there's a lot of different, you know. Uh, again, macro reasons, a lot of different geopolitical reasons should be up there. Here's the bottom line. Until you start to see oil, not just come off, but come off big, you got to make it feel like the global economy is imploding. In my opinion, oil does not show that. The energy complex does not show that. Think about this. If we're going to go into an economic slowdown, people are still arguing about whether we're in a recession right now. And people are still like, well, I think the market might be bottoming over here. Really? Does this look like a market's bottoming at this point? Does the energy sector make you think that we're bottoming right now? Up 40%. Okay. You got to feel like nobody's ever going to get in a car again because there's no reason because no one's going to work because there is no work. That's the kind of price action that you need to feel inside of the energy sector. Okay. For the S and P is to bottom. And I just, I cannot stand when people are talking about a bottom right now in the marketplace, start looking at energy. Okay. By the way, I'm short energy and I'm short pretty heavy in there now. I boosted it to about 600 short shares just in one account. Okay. Another short position using uh, in the money puts in another as a long duration position coming into the cash close here and closing at lows, even more importantly, closing under the 3,600 last, but definitely not least on this weekend's update earnings. Okay, so we looked at the energy complex, we looked at bonds, we looked at dollar and a short squeeze, earnings. How come I haven't been mentioning earnings? As I said, equities, like it's not doing it for me. No one cares at this point. If you saw all the earnings come out today from banks, yeah, how you doing now? <laughs> like JP Morgan had a high of 115. Nobody cares what the earnings happen to be. But there's one critical aspect buried in here. I I'm just very concerned about buybacks. Are any of the big tech companies going to come out and say, hey, by the way, in a rising interest rate environment, it's not a great idea to do buybacks anymore. Buybacks are suspended. Because again, if you're looking for a bottom in this marketplace, there's no bottom until we also start to see the buybacks diminish. Okay. And right now, we just, we have not heard much about stock buybacks being diminished by any stretch of the imagination. Again, I'm like looking for things in here, okay, that are, you know, bright and cheery. There aren't any. Buybacks, come on, you got to think about that. Dollar squeezing to the upside. Bonds breaking lower. S&Ps, clearly, okay, they're on it, man. They're going to close right at 3,600 and just completely leave us in a lurch. Here's the closing bell. That is it for the week. The last point that I'd like to make on this weekend's update, let's go to the SPX, the mother of all products. Again, as I said earlier, volatility, extreme. The actual closing price though in here, maybe not so extreme. Okay, What are we looking at for volatility in the next week of trade? The answer is found right here. If you look basically seven days out, okay, and you wait until precisely 15 minutes after the cash close, you will have the expected move, okay, for the next week, okay? Right now, and this is not settled. These options are technically still open. This is not settled. Right now, the expected move is somewhere around $121. Now, bear with me on this thought. You just came off of a week, right? This week, just came off a week, we had a $124 expected move, okay? Because I think this is a fairly critical point to understand. So when I say we just came off of a week, again, we're looking at this this you know week, this was $124, $124 higher, $124 lower. Did we do it? <laughs> I mean, in one day, okay? Uh, we had like a 100 point move in a matter of what? A few minutes, okay? A few hours later, we rallied back what? Oh, don't worry. We came from 3,500 and shot straight up almost to 3,700. Okay, almost a 200 point move to only turn around, obviously, here and reverse yet again. The moves that we're getting on an intraday basis are as large as 124. And this next week, we're looking for plus or minus 
somewhere around 120. You want to know what the question mark is for? A question mark is for that is insanely light, okay? Hands and feet inside of the vehicle this next week. I mean, come on. Here we are. We're coming into late October. If you're not familiar with the history of October in the markets, well, you better get familiar with it. It's extreme right now. The volatility, okay, with no uncertain terms, it is going to end in a bang at this point. You got to make sure that you got your risk under wraps, all right, that you know that markets can explode lower and rebound thereafter. This is still very far from over. Thanks, everybody, for joining us here at Theo Trade. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.